Dr. Dave Arnold, your host of Cooking Issues, coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan and Rockefeller Center at Newsstand Studios. Joined behind me with uh, John. How you doing, John? Doing great, thanks. Yeah? Yeah. All good? All good. Got Joe Hazen rocking the panels. What's up? Hey, man. Great to see you. Now, nice. Good to see you as well. We got a full crew down in California. We have Nastasia the Hammer Lopez and uh, Jackie Molecules Ainsley. What's up? Hey, hey. 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 Hi. I've, I've made a mistake. I've picked up a super crunchy mini Schneider's gluten-free pretzel that Joe brought it. But now, because we're a, you have to, like what you touch, you take kind of a family, but I don't want to put it in my mouth because it's so freaking crunchy. So I'm just going to have to hold it for the rest of the show, maybe. Oh, no. Yeah. In, uh, on Vancouver Island, in Namaimo, we got uh, Quinn. How you doing, Quinn? Hey, I'm good. Yeah? Yep. All right. Okay. And uh, in the studio today, our special guest, we are super psyched to have Katie Parla here for her new book, Food of the Italian Islands, right? Now, listen, in the show at the beginning, we just go around, say, you just say hello so they know I'm not lying. Ciao. There you go. Okay. So uh, we go around and we just say kind of any kind of random bull crap that's happened to us over the last week before we kind of get into it. So uh, what, what do you guys got? You guys got anything other than these hyper crunchy pretzeloids? Pretzeloids, Joe, because they're not twisted. Everyone in my family, I say, what is a pretzel? They say, twisted. I'm like, what? Twisted. What? Twisted. And they try to bring rods in. Rod is the worst of all the fake pretzel shapes. Right? Unacceptable shape. Right? Not a good shape. It's great for pasta. Great for pasta. Keep it out of my pretzel Oh, bag. by the way, by the way, you and Nastasia need to eventually have... See, you have a much more measured opinion about pasta than... Do I? E, yeah, oh yeah. Then So Nastasia, I don't know if you know this, Nastasia used to have a pasta business with Mark Ladner. And right, I'm not making this up. Pasta Nastasia. flyer. Pasta flyer, right. Yeah. And so she, yeah. do you guys know each other, by the way? Do you guys know each other already? We kind of do. Yeah. We kind of do, but we don't. Yeah. You do, but you don't? You did, but you won't? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so like, you know, she used to get her stuff, uh, like, specially tweaked out. And she was, I'm not allowed to talk about it. She's not allowed to talk about it in Italy. Anyway, so she, Nastasia's basic feeling, why don't you just say what your basic feeling is rather than me paraphrasing it since you're right here. It's a huge category. Well, no, but her, she's like, anyone that tries to make pasta, she's like, I'm giving the, I'm giving the under the, under the chin. People who try to, uh, like, extrude it and dry it at home. Well, Nastasia. Yeah. Yeah, but you I also, like, you don't I like fresh be- pasta either, right? Mostly. Mostly. Most, unless it's, you know... Gotta change. Like there's there's things, but yeah, when people try to make dried pasta at home, I'm it angers me because there's so much great dried pasta like commercially made. Like why are you doing that? You know, it's pointless. And also when, uh, when restaurants uh, do it, it's often terrible, and there's no oh, yeah. point to it. So stop, stop doing that. Wow, we're on the same page here. <laughs> well, except for like, well, okay, so let's go to your book, your new book, Food of the Italian Islands, where you're like you have a whole. Like beautiful. By the way, if you if you hate good photography, don't get the book. Yeah, for sure. Steer clear. Yeah, if you don't like people like looking kind of like sweaty and amazing at the same time, like that guy at the, in the front, like oh the, my god, the guy grilling horse. Yeah, yeah. in hundred degree temperatures yeah, at yeah. night in Catania, the guy, so glistening. The guy looks like like an overweight Greek wrestler. Like he looks amazing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, glistening. It's perfect. Like, amazing. I definitely want to eat that, dudes, whatever. It was grilled horse? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to eat that. Yeah. Yeah. You should. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I have only seen the PDF copy of this book, right? Uh, where is the... It, but the front page, the front cover isn't what I have in the, in the PDF. It's this, like, giant, just, like, full page, like, octo squish. Totally. Okay. Is that the front page? That's front the front is, page. Front is piece or whatever that's it's a, called? That's, like, the end papers. All right. And I'm so sorry I don't have a physical copy. I The book came out today, and I do not have a book. Thanks, UPS. Yeah. That's well, great. I appreciate you for yeah. ruining this for me. I wanted to present all of you with books, but it'll have to wait. UPS is the <laughs> company that, like, a couple things I'll say about UPS. One, like... If they say, when they get it to you on time, they, UPS never brings stuff early. Not ever, not once. Never. If they say it's going to be in five days, that crap can go all the way from California to New York, and it's going to sit in the UPS warehouse until day five, and then it's going to show up. But then, maybe. But maybe. But then if you absolutely, positively, to use FedEx's old thing, need it, they're just not going to give it to you. They're I not going to give it to you. It's upsetting. How is that a business? I disapprove. I they once... 
basically put, I was in a handbag, a leather handbag business with uh, my wife where we actually went to, the, we went to Italy's like kind of like leather district to try to deal with them because they were the kind of one of the last bastions of molded leather and they didn't want to deal with us because we were, you know, like little, <laughs> I, we had an in like actually, uh, what's it called? Um, one of the partners at Kate Spade like hooked us up with their leather person over there and she was still like, no, like she was like, I'll pick you up at the, I'll pick you up at the bus station, I'll tour the factory and then you, you got to get out oh my and gosh. go back to Florence. You know what I mean? So like, anyway, so uh yeah so ups we had like all of these like leathers like full cow hides coming like big thick veg tan stuff that we were gonna and just didn't show up we had all these orders we had to make just didn't show up we're like that's our great. whole that's our whole that's it that's our whole business no same i'm like i did this book and then no one can receive it that's not ideal all right all right, all right. <laughs> so listen well we're gonna get we're gonna get back anything else from the week anything john you got anything in the land of restaurants uh, I did, but I can't remember. So John has a ridiculous, and see whether you can weigh in on this. For every, for every three quarters of a pound of dried pasta for his carbonara, ten egg yolks, right. ten egg yolks. What do you think about this? I think with, when it comes to carbonara, you can do what you feel in the egg department. You Thank can you. even use egg whites. Go nuts! Oh, yeah, no, I tried. I don't know. Yeah, no, uh, all I'm gonna say is I made it again last night. Oh. For the family, because they enjoy John's carbonara recipe. Thank you. Yeah. And my mom got me some of that uh, grano arso flour. Nice. I'm like, well, I'm, what am I going to do with it, though? So, like, she thought I was going to make bread with it. I'm like, I'm not going to, what am I going to, what? So, like, I, I tried to make some earmuffs. I made some pasta, just <laughs> sheeted. I just sheeted and cut it, you know what I mean? Into, like, you know, badly, you know, cut noodles. I didn't care, right? And anyway, so, so many freaking egg yolks to make his thing. So, I was thinking in my head, Every time someone makes your sauce, an angel food cake gets its wings. Because, like, you have to make angel food cakes. <laughs> what am I going to do with all these damned whites? Meringue. Nobody wants okay. that much meringue. Nobody wants that much meringue. No. You go to a pastry shop anywhere in, you know, wherever, where they do meringues. Like, you know, Europe, you know, anywhere. And, like, beautiful window full of freaking meringues. And then they hand you one that's, like, you know, like, big. It's, like, big. And you take one bite and you're like, I'm done. It's I'm too done. Much. It's yeah. too much. Why do I want aerated sugar? That's true. Although, I was at my nephew's birthday party. Get the name of this place. Ready? Okay. Pequatsapis. Pequatsapis. Like, Pequatsapis. It's a nature what? reserve. Pequatsapis. Pequatsapis. And so Wiley, who's opening his new pizza restaurant in, in a week here, Stretch Pizza in uh, New York City. We'll talk about it because you, you wrote a pizza book called The Joy of Pizza. We, in back in the day, we can talk about it. Doing New York, I told you before the radio started, he's doing New York style. And you were like, good. Not trying to imitate somebody else's style, doing New York style, right? Is that what, I assume cool. that's what I got off you. I think that's cool. I think New York style uh, sometimes struggles. And when people are pushing to improve it, that's great. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to trigger Nastasi again. So you went to college in New Haven. See, <laughs> it's such an annoying way to, yeah. we always, oh, I went to school in New Haven. I lived in New Haven for four years. <laughs> <laughs> At orientation, they tell you you have to be that obnoxious forever. Yeah, yeah. so Stas absolutely hates that. Her sister went too, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so Yale, we're talking about Yale. Anyway. Uh, Sorry, Stas. Anyway, so, uh, ah. so point being that you literally before the show was like, oh, New Haven. I like the New Haven pizza because you can't get a clam pizza in, it in Italy. Not a one. Yeah. Yeah. It's infuriating, and no one ever feels bad for me when I tell this story, but yeah, you can oh, get yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> what a poor king. But there's this Frutti di Mare pizza that they do everywhere, where uh -huh. it's basically like frozen mixed mussels and shrimp and all sorts of junk that's just on the pizza. It makes it super damp and gross. <laughs> and I'm like, why don't you guys just do a good one with clams? And, and they won't like, hear it. They're like, no, no. we didn't. Absolutely not. Uh, do they make that for Italians, or do they make that for... Four Italians. Four Italians. Absolutely. Okay. Look, the hot dog and French fry pizza isn't for tourists. It's for Italians. Wow. What, I know. So, a, well, a hot dog and French fry pizza. Well, it's called Verstel. Mm. But, you know, we, we oh, know what it is. Verstel. Yeah. Is it good? That's fine. Yeah. All I right. mean, okay. Yeah. I'll eat it. <laughs> yeah. So, what's the, what, how bad are American hamburgers in Italy? The worst. Really? Worse than, Ger fat. worse than the Germans. Oh, worse. Yeah. Because they use really nice beef, but it's, Super lean cuts. It's zero percent fat. There's no heat applied to it at all. It's basically like a tartare on a bun. <laughs> and then they're like, "Oh, there's like pancetta and like provolone." So it's an Italian burger. I'm like, "Stop doing this!" Or someone go to America, eat a, eat a burger, and figure it out. <laughs> they won't. Because like even an average American burger, unless they've, unless it's the one style of burger I can't tolerate is the super thick hammered burger. The one where they take a super thick burger and then 
and then just hammer the hell out of it. That's the only kind of burger I can't tolerate. I can I like a thin overcooked burger. You know, anyway. I mean, I'll eat a boardwalk burger. I don't care. No. As long as it's not Italian made. And I'm not interested. <laughs> you know, Sorry, I feel like Italy. that's my experience in a lot of Europe is like if any American went there and opened up a burger joint, they would just kill it because everything else is so bad in comparison. But the Italian palate will accept fat in certain forms, just yeah. not in patty form when Ugh. it comes to a burger. Like sausage patty, they're all about it. Okay. But burgers are just so lean and not properly cooked. I'm sad. Yeah. Well, so you have a whole section in your well in your book. Well, I was going to say about the dry pasta before I yes. went off on the tangent that you, you're basically like, listen, this whole like dried pasta like everywhere thing is really like a mid 20th century McGillicuddy anyway and that they didn't really figure out all this drying until you know the machine made stuff until uh late 1800s any hoo-ha so you know this whole like feeling that like everyone's always eating dried pasta forever and that's the way you should do it isn't really the case and people used to make fresh pasta but it was more of a you know more of like a, you know, you had to know how to do it situation. So I, I read into that apparently incorrectly that you're like, oh, there's a place for everything. So you're right. Pasta wasn't really something that was in the Italian diet until the 20th century in terms of like full all the regions. Um, but some of the islands in the book, like Pons and Procida had a really strong Neapolitan influence. When you go there, there's dried pasta and it's freaking amazing. And spaghettoni and spaghetti and uh, ziti and all of these things are perfectly cooked al chiodo, so less cooked than al dente, which just tastes really good and it's more digestible well, and, yeah. you know, brings all these things to the table. I read that section. I don't, Dubious? Wait, well, more digestible. What does that even mean? This is another thing. Nastasia also, you guys could talk for the whole show about Italians and how they only talk about, like, their poops and, like, and what they eat. And it's how- a constipated culture. We want to share. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> I feel attacked. attacked. But it's always so nice when you cook for someone and then the next day they call you up and they let you know how efficiently they, they've digested it. It's so oh. sweet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so nice. You don't know how the meal went until tomorrow. Yeah, no one's like, that was amazing. They're like, I will tell you tomorrow what I think about this meal. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But they don't have the German-style shelf toilets where you get to inspect after you go, right? Oh, my God, the Dutch... They've mastered that, but that hasn't made it down to Southern Europe. It's the worst. It's the worst. I love it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's cool. Okay, okay. Can we just go? I know this is a food food show, but if we can just for a second, like, the problem is Americans buying a shelf-like toilet, but not... Okay, anyone who listens to me out there, if you're one of those people that hasn't figured out that the that the cleaning brush needs to be right next to the... Right next to the toilet. Don't hide the cleaning brush. Get a cleaning brush that, like, is... if you have one of those shelf toilets without a cleaning brush, you're the worst person in the world. You're the worst human that's ever walked on the planet. You know what I'm saying? I agree, and I can tell you're passionate about this. Yeah. Well, I hate it because I've been to people's houses, and you know that if I'm using it in somebody else's house, other than for liquids, there's an issue. I need to go there. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Also, uh, can we get a bidet up in here, America? Oh, well, I, you know, I've said many times on the air, the first time I visited, or the only time I visited Japan, I was like, that's it. We're the worst. We're stupid. And I bought a Toto washlet. Hell and yeah. that was it. They, but they don't do that in Italy, right? No, no. I mean, it makes sense. It would save space in the restroom. But people are very attached to their bidets. It's a ritual people yeah. treasure. Yeah. Well, supposedly the bidets were sold like crazy during COVID. Really? Yeah, because of the lack of toilet paper. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah. Yes, huge influx uh, of purchasing bidets. Now you're now you're tr- triggering me. Both, both los dos. You need both paper and water. It, you know, look, you don't need need. You can you, you can use, use a hole in the ground. But you know what I'm saying. But like you know what I'm saying. See, it's desirable. Definitely desirable. Definitely. Uh, wait, how do we get to talking about this? What the heck? Oh, digestion. Fresh pasta. Okay, I don't know where we were. I don't know where we're going. So the new book. Do you, anyone else have anything from the week? Quinn, you, you like to share a weekly cooking story. You got anything? Uh, yeah, today was actually pretty chill. I made some other uh, vacuum-packed ferments. But in the future, what do I do when I need to talk about all the pasta that I'm making and drawing with my extruder? You can't. You can't talk about it. You have an Arcobaleno? Which one yeah. do you have? Uh, the little one, the AX5. Yeah, yeah listen. Just, you know, like, there's some things that you can't just, you, you know, Nastasia's just going to, you know, it's a, out of respect for Nastasia. You just can't talk about it. You know what I mean? Although. Wait, Quinn, you're making. 
You're making oh. dry pasta? Oh. I mean, I, I've done a few batches. But I think I have a good way to dry it. Silence. Yeah, I'm just going to let that sit. Normally, <laughs> normally, I, Katie, you don't know this. And normally, I don't allow any dead air. Like, I'll just fill any dead air with, with talk. But I'm just going to allow a little bit of dead air there for the Stasia to absorb. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Not bad. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. What about what about you, Jack? You like you always have some story. Did you go to someone's house and they poisoned you this week or what? <laughs> no, um, I made a Japanese curry and um, the spice blend called for dehydrated orange peel. And for whatever I, I was going to ask, I mean, the conversation you're having is way more interesting. I was going to ask about the best way to dehydrate orange peels that doesn't involve waiting what seems like forever on low temp in the oven. Why does it require dehydrated? I don't know, the spice blend. They wanted it, like, ground up with all the spices. But is the spice end up into a paste or a liquid? The spice is mixed with the roux, weirdly. Yeah, that's fine. And ginger, yeah. Look, either, like, order the stuff online, you know, because you're in California. I don't know what L.A.'s Calustians is, but, like, you know, I'm sure you have some sort of weird little (laughs) shop catering to weirdos that sells all the dried stuff for some sort of faux medicinal reason. No offense, L.A. And then you can get some, like, you know, dried orange (laughs) peel there, you know, and then just blend it. Or just, you know, I mean, zest isn't going to taste the same, but it's going to give you some some stuff. You know what I mean? If you take zest and go chaka, 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 and then hit it in the... See, the one issue you're not going to get when you put it into a roux is you're not going to get that slightly brown flavor that you get from dried orange peel when it's been, like, out in the sun or in a dehydrator. Uh, on the other hand, you know, so what? Yeah. You know what I mean? Anyway. Yeah. All right. yeah. All right. So back to the book. The new book, which UPS did not ship to you here, and they shorted Kitchen Arts and Letters. Yes. I was over there the other day with our buddy Matt signing yeah. books. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's called uh, Food of the Italian Islands. That's yeah. right. And what's the name of the photographer you work with? Ed Anderson. Yeah. He's Gorgeous. magical. Gorgeous shots. Now let me ask you a couple, a couple of questions just about books, because I'm sure someone's listening who's interested Let's in, in, in books. Let's do it. All right. Uh, so m- a lot of the other books that you have done, you've done with Simon & Schuster, right? Like you're on their, was it Simon & Schuster? You're on their I've author done... page. Chronicle, Clarkson Potter. All of them then. Voracious. Yeah, this is my seventh cookbook. Right. But okay. it's the first from Parla Publishing. Well, that's what I was going to say. So most people who are self-publishing, I got to ta- ask you about why you're self-publishing because there are people who self-publish because they don't already have a relationship. You have many, right? Yep. You've done many things, you know, like you could walk into any publisher tomorrow and be like, yo, I want to write a book. And they'd be like, let's do that. You know what I mean? That's right. Um, so it's un- I think it's relatively unusual for someone with your publishing experience and history to do self-publishing. So why? Well, creative control is important to me, but even more importantly is being properly compensated for my work. And I researched my books for five years, which is a huge investment. And then as you know from your projects, when you get your advance, even if it's like 100000 which is, you know, pretty good, but relatively average for producing a cookbook, 15% goes to your agent. Right. And then you're only getting the quarter up front, and you've got to pay for all your travel, half the photography, testing, and development. So when I receive advances like that, I'm already ten or 20000 in the hole right. before I get the second round, which doesn't come until several rounds of editing. And then using that money to pay off the expenses from the previous uh, steps and then the photography. And then you've got to promote the book. And then you have to... uh, Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. The author pays for photos. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think some some publishers still do cover photography, but it's few. That's dwindling. But, you know, I kind of, for the first time after a decade of this and 20 in publishing overall, a decade of cookbooks, I looked at how much money I was losing. And I was like, okay, let's do some simple math. If a cookbook costs $35 cover price, Man. how many do I need to sell to break even if I invest 100000 on it? And the answer is like around 2,800 books. So I thought I can sell that. Maybe I can even spend a little more money. And through pre-sales, 
generate capital to cover the production expenses and then start earning money pretty soon after publication. Right, but you're in the hole for the whole production cost, though. Not really, because I, the printer doesn't want everything up front. They're fine paying you in... Well, I mean, I mean, going around the country, Italy, and that had not been cheap. No, it's definitely not cheap. But it's also included in that, like, the 100K hypothetical, nice round number, covers the printing, the binding, the editor, development editor, copy editor, yeah. proofreader. It covers all the travel. It covers publicity. And it also covers the logistics, moving a container of books to a warehouse and then storing those books because it costs like, I don't know, three cents a month or something for each book to be in there. And then also the um, uh, the costs that the, the logistics company charges just for the honor of doing business with them. And so it might seem like you're putting out a lot of money right away, but you're not. Huh. And so... So you, your experience with it has been so far positive. Unbelievably positive. With the exception of UPS. UPS <laughs> is the worst. I also am not a super fan of Shopify. Yeah. The creation of this book, which I thought was going to be really complex and challenging, printing it, having it bound, having it moved across an ocean, that was all incredibly smooth. But getting it from a warehouse in New York to mainly bookstores, to retail uh Retail customers, it's been a dream. Everyone's got their book already, and it's just out today. So that's right. been great. But getting, you know, cartons of books to now serving to even Matt lost a couple uh, a couple of cartons. So I now have to do all sorts of, like, customer service and troubleshooting, which is super annoying. Well, what about the stuff that the uh, normal, normal, that publishing houses do, like, you know, the book, like, getting them into, like, mom and pop shops, like the McNally Jacksons and all of these things, is that a hassle for you or no? I simply write an email um, with a presentation of the book and a PDF and ask to be placed in the bookstore. And sometimes people say yes. Yeah. There's a nice bookstore in Mystic. I forget the name of it. You should get in there. I know. People have been recommending a bookstore in Mystic. Yeah. There's only one, so mm -hmm. it's the same one. I forget the name of it. They didn't buy my book, but whatever. I'm what ifs? What ifs? <laughs> you still like them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not like that. I'm not, a vind I'm not as vindictive as people make me out to be, but, you know. But mm -hmm. it's also been really nice to partner with independent bookshops, um, Kitchen Arts and Letters is this incredible place, and every time you go in there, you just want to walk out with the entire stock. Um, so that's been really special to have Matt ha have the book in stock. I sign the books, and people can pre-order or now order and then get a signed copy, which I think is really special. Um, the same with Omnivore, Now Serving, Book Larder, uh, Bold Fork. All of these great small businesses are, are partners that I always have been doing business with sort of through larger publishers, so the direct contact has been really nice. I noticed you didn't do the pre-order stuff on Amazon. Are you going to sell normally with them or no? I am, but I wanted to prioritize independent bookstores oh, and then you. sales through my website, which has, of course, the, the highest margin right. first. Um, and, you know, like when you write for a big publisher, you get access to like the back-end analytics. And so I know that my books sell very well on Amazon, but I also could justify not putting it out on Amazon right away so I could sort of front load the sales in the smaller um, markets. Right. Make the, make the most money from the people who want the book the most and then put it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. And also just, you know, being, being in contact with readers is super important and super special to me. My books improve because of their feedback. Um, and so knowing that anyone who has the book gets, you know, an email from me with the delivery information and they can write to me with questions. I think that that's, uh, that's so special. Now, when you're writing a book like this, which like, you know, as you say in the introduction, like, you know, you could have spent just an infinity of time in any one of these, like, areas. Because the, the Italian island spans all the way from the extreme northeast down all the way to the extreme southwest. Uh, so, when you're doing that, how do you... Like, so do you write the book and then go back and shoot it? Are you doing catch as catch can? Like, how do you organize your life around doing something that's over such a large space and over such a large period of time? So I write the book first and then I shoot it. And I want to have a pretty good idea of what the features are and manage the travel based on that. So like we did... Ed came to Italy, we traveled, and we did Ischia, we went all over Sardinia and Sicily, um, we went to Venice, and kind of had to had to figure out how to encapsulate so many disparate areas 
during a 10-day shoot. I think he did a really spectacular job. Whoa, 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 job. whoa, whoa. What? Oh, yeah. That book was shot in 10 days? Yeah. What? I'm a small publisher. I'm, I'm on a budget, baby. Okay, guys, guys. <clears throat> uh, I don't know where you can go see a sample PDF. Is there a place they can see a sample PDF? No, but they can or buy not, the you book. Know, not, or like, don't you have like a sample oh, chapter? Uh, on shop.katieparla.com, there are pages. Like when you, especially if you're on mobile, you see the cover and then you can look at the individual pages. Yeah, I would not have guessed. 10 day shoot. First of all, I need to know what kind of meth you were taking during that time to be able to get all of those shots in 10 days. Addy, you know it. I'm just joking. <laughs> My mom's listening. You're like, I'm just <laughs> joking, joking, not joking, joking, not joking. JK, JK. Yeah. Uh, but wow, that's freaking impressive. I mean, Ed is such a delightful human, full stop. Like, I would love working with him no matter what, but he's incredible at shooting people, landscapes, and food really fast. All but a couple of the dishes were shot in situ. I didn't want to do any studio at all. And I, I'm I'm always floored by his work, but I was really like, the, the photos are breathtaking and really transportive. That's bananas. One of my favorites uh, near the beginning, uh, and I can't, pronou- I can't pronounce it. By the way, you just, here's what you need to do. Anytime, which is all the time that I butcher anything, just just tell me how it's pronounced. Just inter- literally interrupt. And uh, what's the island? Uh, is it Ischia? You nailed it. Uh, so, okay. So this dude, this old dude is sitting on a bench and behind him is like a mosaic that's like I heart Ischia and he's sitting on this bench like eh, like staring off on the side and I was like love it framed like there was a a, the whole thing's encrusted with seashells yeah yeah, yeah. all beautiful but the guy's like got this he looks like right out of central casting it's crazy and Ed's so good at like finding those moments and the whole reason we ended up in Ischia is because we were supposed to go to Pantelleria and we got to the uh, the Naples airport at four in the morning and found that the flight had been canceled. Mm. And not just the flight, but like the whole airline. <laughs> so yeah. what, what are you we do? were like, uh, I guess we'll go to Ischia. And we end up having incredible, incredible shoot day. Speaking of uh, the former place, which I always butcher the pronunciation of, you have a whole page on capers. See, si. they convince me that the caper berry is a good product. I love capers, but why would I? Why like caper berry is yeah. like a big watery. Is it? I don't know. They're like watery, salty. Like, what are they? What, why would well, I want to you're talking about the big boys, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I don't know anything about that. I know the Pontelleria and Salina caper berries are really small, like compact, and they're, they're dry. They're not dry, dry, but they're not right. oh, like watery. Right. And so you they buy taste, them salt pack like you do the yeah, capers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not in brine or anything, just literally layered with salt and... Uh, the capers, the caper berries, and the caper leaves are all processed in Pantelleria, and they all taste like capers. Caper leaves. That's interesting. I hadn't had that one. I've never had that one. I saw that on the page. And, like, what do you, what do you, what do, you do with those? Rehydrate and, like, like chiffonade those suckers? But they're tiny. But is that what you, what do you normally do? What Sprinkle do you, them on a salad or toss them with a little bit of olive oil and put them next to a piece of fish. Now, <clears throat> compare, if you will, like, the really good salt pack ones that, like, come into, like, the little bags or the... Compare those with... The Goya brand brined uh, capers in the jar, like, just, like, just compare. I mean, the savoriness and intensity of the caper flavor in the salt-packed ones from, like, La Nikia, which is the place that I visited, um, it's like tasting the sea and the earth. It's so powerful. There's, like a, I, tea, there's a tea note that's lost in the brine guys, too, right? Isn't there? I yeah, haven't had the... It dilutes, it, it I, dilutes yeah, the flavor. I haven't had a salt packed in a long time. And, I mean, probably you know better than I. There's some sort of, like, osmosis that happens when they're water cured, which is how they're usually cured in the, like, the jarred ones. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I always it, thought like, they were salted and then just stored in brine. I thought they were made the same and then stored in brine. They're made differently? Yeah, I think huh, so. Huh, huh. How do you rehydrate the salt the, the salt pack ones? How do you use them? Because no, most oh. people here haven't used a salt pack one. So what do you, you do? You have to rinse them and change the water several times, like bacala. I'm sure everyone's mm. cooking bacala all the time and knows exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you, you just, you taste it. You keep tasting it. When it tastes not like overpoweringly salty, then it's ready to use. Yeah. You know what's disgusting is uh, spilling the soaking water all over the laundry room when you're a kid. It's not great. It's not ideal. (laughs) It's not. Certainly not ideal. Yeah. Why didn't we do it outside? Because, you know, we have a a fear of, a fear of, I don't know, everything spoiling. So, you know, I guess, did my mom put it in the fridge and then I took it out to change it and I dumped it all over the laundry room? I don't know. Oh, man. It was just. That's got to stink. 
Ew, stinks really bad. <laughs> stinks really bad. But most of the time when I cook with uh, salt fish, salt cod now, I, I use the thin stuff and it can be soaked really quickly. It's only mm-hmm. like Christmas Eve time that I, I get the thick stuff that takes days and days to reconstitute. Yeah. You like that stuff on Christmas Eve? I do. Yeah. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Let's get to some of the Patreon. By the way, John, how do they call? If they, if they have a question uh, for Katie, they want to call in live at 917-410-1507. That's 917-410-1507. Tell them how they can become a Patreon member and listen live. Patreon.com slash cooking issues. Get to listen live. You get the call in number. You get prioritized uh, your questions answered. We got cool guests coming. We work with awesome people like Matt Sartwell, get you discounts on awesome books like Katie's book. And we've just got a bunch of fantastic guests coming on. So sign up and, you know, join what all the cool kids are doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. Uh, all right. So let's, I have, because I, I have a list of things from the book that, that I could do, but I I have to get to the Patreon questions. But before I do that, little swipe at the Venetians. You say the Venetians like an overcooked pasta. What's that all about? They don't like it. They love it. Like how overcooked? Like beyond. <laughs> like cooked perfectly and then 10 more minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> Venice is a... I love Venice. Venetians out there. Love ya. Can't get enough. But uh, it's a rice, but mostly a polenta city. And pasta is present in the culture in the form of beagley, um, which appear on the cover, which you will eventually see. And so the the way that people cook pasta in Italy really does change from place to place. And the closer you are to Naples, the more al chiodo you'll find it, which is almost crunchy at times. Um, whereas when you head up north, it's not, not just the Venetians that overcook pasta. It's northern people in general. Ooh, I like the swipe at the northern people. All the north. Because usually, right... The, the swipes at the North aren't cultural swipes. Where This is a hardcore cultural swipe at the North. I appreciate that. Yeah. They're yeah. rejecting Italian identity by overcooking pasta. Wow. You're like, they're trying to turn it back to polenta somehow. Exactly. They're like, can I, can I just make this into a big stew or something? Wow. Gross. Yeah. Wow. So uh, I, li- I like this. I like, see, this is the kind of thing that I, that I like, you know what I mean? Or like, uh, you get lots of choice. Uh, like uh, anecdotes in the book, like uh, the lady not letting you open the window on the train. I almost died that night. It's like you said, it was like 100 degrees in this train. It was the hottest day of the year in the year 2000. And I took a train from Rome to Palermo, which takes like 15 hours. But everyone on the train was afraid of a draft. And so I had to be like hot boxed in this sleeper car with these four women without, a, without any air. And they were fine. They were cool with it, but I wasn't accustomed to that yet. So I thought I was going. I thought I was dying. And what was the phrase? Is like the the, the draft is going to make my neck break or something like this. It was the something like uh, it was some like crazy phrase. I'm going to get a cervicale, which means like the draft is going to cause like trauma to my cervical vertebrae. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that's diagnosed on a train, but yeah. anyway, that's uh, it's good business. I Wait, lo- I love it. Yes. Katie. Wait, I have a question. Have you ever have you done the train that goes on the boat? Oh, have I? So listen, I was on this train. I was 20 years old and I thought obviously the train from Rome to Palermo will cross the Strait of Messina on a bridge. At five in the morning, I am hallucinating from being so hot in this car and I hear clanking around me and all the women get off get out of the car and I'm like we're dr- like I'm drowning like clearly we're in the sea <laughs> and they had gone up to the top of the boat to watch the Strait of Messina crossing meanwhile I have no idea we're on a boat yeah. but the train got on a boat next to another train and then we like went the two miles across the sea and I was like I'm, I'm going to die here I'm out of my depth it was crazy <laughs> have you done that yeah I was like what Italian was like yeah we're gonna put the train on a boat like it's crazy it's crazy it's bananas i mean i i kind of love it but it scared me to death the first time yeah yeah so you did it again though i did it again <laughs> yeah but i was aware of what was going on i see so it's better yeah also like these women in the car when we get on the car right they're like i don't know italian at the time so they're like we need to explain to this dummy that it's so dangerous on the train. Someone could gas us and then steal all of our luggage. <laughs> That's why we're going to barricade the door to the sleeper car. And they did the pulling the eye, under the eyelid down, be like, be careful, like we're going to get robbed. And then they still all got out of the car to go watch the Strait of Messina crossing. And I think I'm there 
drowning, but also protecting all the luggage. Well, it they was left, very they left the American to drown. Right. Like, peace. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Mm. Love it. Love it. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, let me get to these questions. Otherwise, I'll forget. And then, oh, my God. Oh, my God. One more, though. Let's do it. So <laughs> you also have had some bad situations. You also don't enjoy TSA people very much or whatever the Italian equivalent of TSA is. No, it's. I'm fine with that with the Italian analog because they. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Pistachio. You know what? Sometimes those people treat pistachio paste like liquids when right. you try to check uh, check into a plane, and it's not. It's a paste. Yeah, and there you said they were Brontes, right? So expensive. It wasn't just Bronte. It was uh, Corrado Asensa's Cafe Sicilia, like basically green gold spread. And I've had more than more than a dozen tubs confiscated <laughs> at the Catania <laughs> Airport, and it's so. Upsetting. I'm still sad about it. Yeah, yeah, and you, you, like you, we can't argue with those. But you said that they're eating it. Basically, they're like, "Thank I'm you." I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. That's not going in any incinerator. Yeah, I, I, like my worst one with that was with a uh, with a meddler paste in in England, and she's like, "That's a liquid." I opened the jar, turned it upside down, and nothing came out. I'm like, "Not a liquid." And she yeah. goes, "Well, you could melt it, and it would be a liquid." I go, "You could melt me, and I'd be a liquid." <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yeah, but I have to let you on the plane. I was like, uh, oh, my gosh. oh, my gosh. You can't get meddlers here. That's crazy. Anyway. Well, the islands are full of them, so come on over in the summer. Really? Oh, yeah. And they bled them and make them into a jelly and all this crap? or they... just eat them. That's, uh. And, yeah, we don't even really make any paste out of them. It's just like you eat it. No. No. All right. Good to know. Oh, uh, I got to get to these. I got to get to the questions that they have. Otherwise, you know, whatever. We'll be here forever. And I'm not allowed to. Joe's going to turn off the mic. It's going to get. Uh... All right. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Wizmerd writes in, I'm heading to Puglia for about a week and a half in May. I'll be splitting my time between, uh, how do you pronounce Monopoly over there? Mon Monopoly. Mon okay, well, nice. And, Monopoly. uh, and Leche. Uh, I noticed in a piece you wrote in 2017 that you were quite critical of the food scene, uh, of Salento, uh, and quite criti critical generally of the area. Do you still feel the same way? Has it upped its game in the intervening years? Thank you. So it, this is probably referring to the piece that I wrote for Australian Gourmet Traveler about Puglia. Um, I have Australian Gourmet Travelers. I'm just kidding, Australia. Oh, love you. killing the game. So I think what I, it wasn't a criticism in my opinion. It was acknowledging that m most Pugliesi don't go out to eat all the time. And so the restaurants are mainly geared towards tourists. And also in 2017, that's after crises and people are thinking about margins, cutting corners on ingredients. So I think I said, something that's true for all Italian regional travel, which is you've got to really plan where to go. And I've got a lot of resources, not just in that article, but also on the City Guides page of my website that directs people to cooks doing really nice things. And I think a lot of visitors make the mistake of planning a lot of restaurant dining when it's actually a mix of restaurants and cafes and cafeterias and bakeries that will really give the full panorama and introduce you to how people in Puglia or wherever actually eat. Yeah. So make some, make some friends with some locals before you go? Never hurts. Yeah. Uh, Rob L. wants to, uh, wants to know, uh, are there any noteworthy new examples of uh, Pecorino uh, Romano, the, the, the genuine article, which you say most of it's made in uh, Sardinia? 97%. Of... Yeah. 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 Are there any new... Uh, Pecorino producers in Lazio? Well, that they can look for around Rome, or better yet, in the USA, to spare us from the monotony of industrial uh, Pecorino. But he said Pecorini, but I, I have to say Pecorinos because I'm American. I can't, okay. I can't do it. Uh, yeah. And characterless uh, Parmigiano uh, that we have available here. Okay, so um, there are only a couple of producers, like literally 1% okay. of Pecorino Romanos made in Lazio, 2% in Tuscany, 97% in Sardinia. Um, Fulvi is a producer near Rome that is exported. Right. And they I have find, that here. Yeah, yeah like absolutely. I mean, I literally stuff, got yeah. it at Whole Foods last night. Um, so shout out to that small business. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> that's the one that that's the one that you're going to be able to find that's going to have a flavor intensity that uh, mirrors what Romans eat. Romans also mostly eat Sardinian pecorino. Man. Pecorino Romano made in Sardinia. And, you know, I think it's there's a little bit of tension there, right? Because you might have producers that are very large, but most of the people that are giving the milk to these companies are really small farmers, and they deserve like dignity and support and 
and a place to sell their milk. Well, that's like the Parmigiano. It's all the consortio, right? Like all the small mm -hmm. folks give their stuff to the consortio and then totally. right, it becomes, becomes like mega cheese. That stuff's pretty good, though. Yeah. Yeah? Sure. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Italian cheese, so no small producer that you can recommend that Rob can look There's around for? There's no small producer. I mean, there are a lot of people making Pecorino, but not Pecorino Romano. Right. Uh, talk to me about this Italian uh, Kraft American Singles product that you said that they were using in your book. I'm trying to find the name of it. I wrote Galbani. Oh, oh my God. Galbani is also exported. So Galbani is uh, an industrial cheese. Right. It's, I mean, we could spend several minutes reading the ingredients list. Like there's maybe dairy derivatives in it, but it's used in so many like cafeteria um, meat dishes. So like meatballs with little bits of Galbani in it, um, or in the case of the book, the Bracciole alla Messinese. It's little, it looks like little cheese steaks that you wrap around pieces of really crappy quality cheese and then yeah. it all melts together. Yeah. So when it comes to that, or just the sottiletta in general, which is like a craft single uh, in Italian, those cheeses, they're super melty, they're super sticky, and they end up in a lot of home food and then like those little takeaway joint foods. Um, if you put a beautiful like tuma or cacciacavallo in there, it wouldn't melt the way you need it to. Could and that's you, too fancy for that dish. Could you do like an Italian queso with Calabrian peppers and this stuff? Why not? Would it taste good? Sure. I mean, everybody likes queso. See, si. Yeah. Queso delicious. Uh, <clears throat> Christian Sacco writes in, uh, I know double questions are sacrilegious to, uh, to Nastasia, but hopefully these are quick. Uh, I don't even know how to ask you this. Rank the Roman pastas. Okay. I'm going to... How many are you going to choose? Like what? Like The best Roman pasta is rigatoni with the sauce, leftover sauce that oxtails have braised in. Okay. After which... For my tastes, rigatoni with the intestines of milk-fed veal, followed by gricha, carbonara, cacio e pepe, and amatriciana. Uh -huh. All right. Because everyone says that there are three Roman pastas or four Roman pastas, and that's only people who don't live in Rome that think that. Really, in Rome, the rigatoni dishes that I mentioned with the oxtail sauce and the paiata are so much more emblematic than many of the others. Talk to me about the veal intestines. How are they produced? How are they pr prepared? So the intestines are harvested with the mother's milk still inside and butchers will lay out the squiggly intestines and then cut them into maybe six inch long segments and then use call fat to tie those into rings and then cook them like little cheesy sausages nice. in tomato sauce. Uh, until super tender, and then it's customary to break one open into the sauce, so it makes kind of like a creamy, ricotta-y, kind of funky uh, undertone in the sauce, and then you toss it with rigatoni, and it's delicious. I want that. Sounds so I know. Good. Yeah. I want that. You got to go to Rome. It's, it, it, you couldn't even get it in Cagliari or Palermo or Firenze. Like, it's such a Roman thing. It's like all the spleen in Italy ends up in... Palermo, right. all the intestines go to Rome. I was just about to, yeah, all the spleen in, in uh, now you have that all the Golden California song going through my head. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> in a bank in the middle of Beverly Hills. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, so you have the, the, the sandwich in Palermo. And what's the name of the Palerm Palermese sandwich bread? They've, uh, Bastida. What? Bastida. Looks nice. Looks good. It's fine, yeah. It's I've good. never been. Anyway, uh, so it's this like, uh, it's like lard poached uh, spleen and lungs. And you're like, you might have a hard time getting spleen. You can't get lungs, although I've heard that they're changing the law. I heard we're going to be able to get lungs again in the U.S. That's great. Now if we can get horse? Well, yeah, you big, have a big old horse steak. But you say the beef's pretty close. I've never had the horse steak. What are your thoughts on the horse steak? Super lean. Yeah. Good if you cook it and real fast and then drench it in olive oil and oregano and you're good to go. So when you say cook it real fast, like... So, like, Nastasia used to work for uh, Cesare Casella, Tuscan. Amazing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're all friends, right? And so he used to raise the Chianina cows, right? Mm -hmm. Which are these big, big cows. Big boys. Big cows. And then he'd get the steak, and Nastasia and I would go, and he's like, Ch -ch -ch. and we're like, what? What? Oh, well, that's a thick steak. When people eat horse in Sicily, it's generally like a super thin pounded steak. I'm going to bring up cheesesteaks for the, for the maybe fifth time. This Cheesesteaks are delicious, though. <laughs> I love them. I treasure them. Maybe that's why I like this dish so much. But it's a piece of, of horse that's been pounded really, really thin and then just, like, cooked a, very fast on both sides by 
ideally a sweaty, sweaty man oh, yeah. on the streets in Catania mm. and then served on a plate so it like overflows the dimensions of the plate. It's amazing. I went, uh, I hate, speaking of sweaty, sweaty men serving things, I hate the San Gennaro Festival here in New York City. <laughs> I absolutely hate it. What? It's not super fun? <laughs> oh, my God. Especially if, like, it's in your neighborhood. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, or it's in, it used to be in my transit. I used to have to go through it. I detest it. I did detest it, right? But I went there once, and there was a guy, sweaty, sweaty guy, running the sausage and pepper thing. Gotta get the sausage. Yeah, and he pulled up his shirt and did a belly, like, one of those... Where his belly is doing the waves. <laughs> and I was like, oh I, I couldn't eat sausage and peppers for like like years. That's amazing. It's horrifying, right? I disagree. This is where we, we depart. I think that's really sexy. Oh, my God. So in, uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the Time Life Foods of the World series, the one with Italy has a spread on Tuscan bread. And in it, the guy is clearly wearing like... Uh, you know, like boxer shorts that like are allowing everything, you know, and he's wearing like a shirt, like a, like a, like, like a sleeveless shirt and he's baking the bread and you can see the sweat dripping into the bread. And well, how else is, is it going to have salt? That's exactly what I was saying. <laughs> that's the only source of salt. So like, you know, maybe if you're making a Tuscan bread, really, it's just this dude's freaking sweat. That's the salt and you're getting the, the stuff up. That's nah, disgusting. Disgusting. <laughs> Speaking of salt. And baking, uh, super interesting uh, section towards the well. It's once in the middle in the pasta section, and then at the end in the in the appendices uh, is I did not know this hand pulled Italian noodles. Uh, what's the uh, threads of God say? It. Su filindeo. Uh, beautiful. It's it's very similar to the. There's a Portuguese word also for something similar that's not that, but that's similar word. Fide, I forget anyway. Um, I did not know this culture thing existed, but but get this, people. Uh, so there's a QR code in the book you can scan, and then you can go see the 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 master making her making it. John Franca de Tori. But so get this: they hand stretch the hand pull the noodles, and it's very similar to the Chinese hand pulled noodles. Uh, and it requires salt. If you don't salt it. It won't work because you have to overwork the dough to break down the glutenin so that the gliadin is doing its thing. And it's very, it's very um, extensible without being very elastic. Anyway, I digress. But get this, people. She has this basket. What's the basket called? It's like wide, narrow. It's like it's, like a, it's not oh, a basket really. A, I'm not sure what the name is, but it's a wicker disc. Yeah. And she stretches it and then lays them across each other at an angle and then lets it dry into like... A big old disc, it's right? A, it's three diagonal layers of super thin pasta made from durum wheat, which is very uh, difficult to make extensible until yeah. you really need the, the heck out of it. Um, see how I'm censoring myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really good. Family show. Yeah, yeah. Nastasi also hates it. It's a family show. It's another <laughs> trigger, but there you go. Um, and then that disc, after it's dried, is broken into a mutton broth uh, with a, an acidulated sheep's milk cheese. And it's... Well, it used to just be served around the holidays related to San Francesco. And now, because it's such an iconic thing that so many people in Sardinia are proud exists, now you can find it all over the subregion of the Barbaja, where the town of uh, its origin is located. And you can even find it like rest stops and cafes. And you could find it in other parts of the island too, whereas it used to just be one very specific hyper-regional dish. Yeah. I was like, I want that. I know. You do want that. It feels like velvet on your palate it's it's such an incredible like mouthfeel really awesome go yeah. to sardinia man i would love to go i would love to go hey speaking of sardinia how the heck did france end up with corsica oh that i don't know probably something from the savoys or I, I'm not it's sure. not french no it feels more sardinian if anything all those like all those delicious funky cheeses and the knife culture and the band tree. Mm, you like the you like the you like the knives. Sardinian Love. knives has a whole page on Sardinian knives, and uh, you gave it actually a, like a website shout out. You can go. She's like every town she says has this like like a not every town many towns have a culture like like handmade knife folks. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's certain knife shapes that are named for their town of origin, but you can go to like I, this has not failed me yet. You go to a Sardinian town. You say, I really like knives. Do you know anyone who sells them? And they'll call their neighbor, their cousin, their grandpa. And that person has like a little foundry in their garage where they make knives with 
horns that they say they find <laughs> instead of hunting the right. endangered animals for them. <laughs> but, found, it, found at the end of a rifle. Yeah. Exactly. And so uh, it's it's really fun, especially if you're into like gardening, you can get grafting knives. Uh, I use my skinning knives all the time, not for skinning boars, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, like I take it on a hiking trip and, and use it for all sorts of food preparation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right, we got to get to more of these questions that we... Uh, oh, and the second one, uh, after the Roman pasta, and I don't know if you like these questions or hate these questions, but if you had to pick the recipe from the new book you'd really like people to actually make, what would it be? Oh, my God, that's a really hard question. I do like this question. It's, it challenges me. How about that mint pistachio uh, pesto? That's actually exactly what I was going to say, right? Um, but I would say one of the pestos for sure. There's seven in the book. Why don't you talk about your uh, dislike for everyone only thinking pesto is the is the? I'm sick and tired of Geneva getting all the pesto attention. <laughs> so pesto is you know loosely defined something that's like mashed up that generally includes herbs and nuts and garlic, sometimes cheese, definitely oil. And there are pestos all over Italy, especially concentrated in Sicily, and there's even one in Sardinia. And I like the pistachio and mint pesto flavor so, so much. It's not traditional per se, but, you know, cuisine's always evolving. So once upon a time, no one made pesto in Tropani, and now they do, and so it's a thing. Uh, on, on Mount Etna, where a lot of pistachios grow, um, you find places are serving pistachio pesto with whatever the seasonal herb is. And I think that one's just really delicious. But in terms of like a super classic recipe, the caponata is really nice. Um, it's dairy and gluten-free, so it literally can be consumed by almost everyone unless you have a, a nightshade um, intolerance. And it's the this classic sweet and sour eggplant dish, but it's got almonds in it, which I think give a nice toasty flavor and texture contrast make it a little hardier. And I, I just love that one. Yeah. Uh, I like the last, the last pesto recipe in the pesto section is get any two nuts and any two herbs. Just get two different nuts and get two different herbs. Forget about it. <laughs> Some cheese. Anyway, uh, so, uh, wait, you, eggplants. So you have this one recipe in there, which, <clears throat> so it's these small eggplants, whole. You slice them on the bottom like they're like a, like a, like a, like a tutu, like a dress. And then you salt them for a while, and then you fry them whole and let them go. Is that greasy as hell, or is it delicious, or both? Both. Okay. Of course. What kind of grease are you supposed to cook it in? I forget. What do they cook it in? Everyone uses generic vegetable oil or peanut oil, and they have these bubbling cauldrons of oil on the streets in Palermo where they prepare a lot of this stuff. Some people also have little tiny brick and mortars, um, but as the eggplant fries, the kind of like legs of the eggplant start to spread out like the wings of a bird, um, and so it's called uh, a quail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Qual qualia, right? Qualia? Mm -hmm. Si. Yeah. Yeah. Bravissimo. And then uh, you also have sardines in the manner of a songbird uh, in, in the book, yeah. uh, which are like, are those good, those stuffed sardines? They're so good. And it's it's got a lot of the Sicilian sweet and sour stuff going on. There's uh, orange in the uh, in the recipe and... Currants, right? Currants. Yeah. Pine nuts. It's it's delicious. Uh, so, uh, what you have a so this book, I guess you say, unlike the other books, you're arranging it by like uh, function rather right. than by location. But one of the things that and there is a fish section. But one of the things you point out several times is that not people aren't eating as much fish on the islands as you necessarily would think. You want to talk about that? Other than the Venetian islands, yeah. I mean, fish is really <laughs> expensive. Um, it's a commodity that the small islands sustain themselves by selling. Um, and above all, the cuisines historically until the 20th century when ice and refrigeration and wealth came to Italy, um, fish was uh, not something that you could count on sustaining you. You'd have to go out in dangerous waters and fish it, and there might be pirates out there, literally. And so the island cultures, whether it's the larger ones, Sicily and Sardinia, the smaller ones, Pons and Procida, they had to figure out what they could live off of in an isolated place, regardless of the weather, and really influenced by their terrain. So that that's why you got a lot of like rabbits on Ischia and not a ton of beef, right? Right. You said that the uh, your whoever's running the hotel is like get in land, get some rabbits. Go to someone who has a cave, get a rabbit. Why caves? <laughs> why always a rabbit in a cave? Not sunny, I guess. They don't die it's from a this. Sunk, it's a sunken pit, really. Mm. Oh, so I'm, I'm running away. You're glorifying it by calling it a cave. It's Make more it fancy. It's more like 
put, it puts the lotion on the skin kind of a situation. That's right. Yeah. You wouldn't want to eat it if you thought about that. That's what we in, immediately think about. The well, Silence of the Lambs. Because that is one of the great <laughs> all-time movie situations. It's amazing, but you're not like, I want Ischia-style rabbit after this. I do. <laughs> put the rabbit in the basket! You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, True. I'm okay. all about Touché. it. Touché. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. convinced. All right, yeah. Well, next time, next time when you, you know, you know, next time you talk about it. How about so, it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, a recipe that I thought that John would particularly uh, like be interested in and pissed off that he can't try the real one is because you have to substitute all different things is dogfish, mm. which is, I guess a sharkaloid, right? Yeah. yeah. You can literally go to the Jersey Shore or probably the river and get some. I've never seen one for sale, though. I don't think they're sold. I just accidentally catch them here. So you hack, you, you you cut up the meat, you cook it in like a in like a broth. I don't remember what kind of broth. And vinegar. then what vinegar? And then and then you and then you take its liver mm -hmm. and you cook that with walnuts, make a paste out of it, put it back in with vinegar, and let it cure overnight. It's so good. It's so good. It's called burrida, and it's the dish of Cagliari, which is the port town on the southern coast of Sardinia. And when you go to the market there, the San Benedetto market is the largest fish market. Maybe it's the largest market by area in all of Europe. The entire uh, sunken floor, another cave reference, um, is filled with fishmongers, and they all have specialties. Some are just tuna, some are just mollusks, but everyone's got dogfish, and it looks like they prepare it for you, right? It's already sold prepped. So it looks like a bunch of, like, snake chunks in a bucket <laughs> which granted i'm not doing a great job of making this sound appetizing but it's like it's bony and cartilaginous and it really absorbs all these beautiful flavors and the monk not the monkfish liver the the dogfish liver just brings like a real uh sweet earthiness to it it's one of my favorite things ever yeah nice yeah uh, I oh. thought he's gonna be like I can't have it. That's why I tell. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's, okay. that's why I brought it up. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Fup Jack wants to know: Will you have another book launch party at Fiorella's when I, where I first encountered entrees from Food of the Italian South years ago? You bet. And it sold out so fast that we added an afternoon signing. So the dinner, which is on Friday the no Saturday the eleventh, is sold out. 10 minutes after it opened. Uh, Rochester, people are my people. They've been so supportive from day one. And from 10 to 2 uh, on Saturday, I'm going to do a just a signing. People can come by. They'll be serving coffee. And uh, I'll personalize your book. I like that. Um, okay. you go to, If you go to Rochester, you got to check out our boy Donnie Clutter book. Oh, I know. Yeah. I got to spend more time in these cities. Yeah. I'll yeah. probably like, end up eating at the airport. It's like so sad. The, yeah, I, I might end up spending more time in Rochester. Rochester's I don't know. great. I like Rochester. I love it. Uh, okay, so uh, one of the things Nastasi likes to poke fun at me the most is uh, a night that I double st uh, starched Booker, my older son, and Nastasi was on the phone with him, and he, he's like, "Your dad's making too much starch," and that's all I could think of when I saw this sandwich. We got two more minutes, don't worry. I got this sandwich in Palermo, where it's literally a hunk of bread, a square of fried chickpea. <laughs> dough in a square, in a flat square, which it's, is kind of weird. Yeah, it's a number of layers of it. And you know what? Not enough starch, some potato croquettes, and then I'm like, well, they got to slatter this mother in mayonnaise or something. Just lemon. So yeah. it, And it, iodized salt from, like, the stickiest, sketchiest shaker in the world. But is that good? It's spectacular. It's really? It's so good. Yeah, it's really? really, really good. Yeah, and the buns, like the Vastetta buns, are like the seeded... Uh, Durham wheat buns bring like a little bit of like sweetness to it. You've got the acid from the the uh, seasoning, and uh, I mean potatoes taste good. Chickpeas when fried taste good. What's what's bad about it's this? It's just carb on carb on carb on carb. That's right. But who? So what? All right, all right, okay. <laughs> Let the Palermitani get their calories, man. Jeez. All right. Um, to see what I, I, there's so much in this book that when you go, oh, I know. Talk to me about this bread casserole. So you get oh. the you get the stale bread. You put some beef meat broth meat broth. I forget which meat mutton th or whatever you got and cheese, and you bake that sucker. Yeah, talk to me about this. I always put uh, stale bread recipes all over my cookbooks, and this is a favorite. Yeah, you just take big chunks of stale bread, layer them in a in a casserole with layers of cheese between them. Pour over that broth, more cheese on top, and then you bake it. And it's like the the like bready cheesy part of a French onion soup. It's uh, fantastic. That sounds real good. Yeah. It's like, you know, with not too starchy for you. 
<laughs> That's not me. Remember, I, I, I'm the one that committed this thing. And we also, you know, because uh, whatever, like we always like to do the big night. It's a starch. It's a starch. Like, um, uh, and on the way out, raw artichokes, raw artichoke salad with botarga, huh? Raw, what's yeah. come on? Raw artichoke salad with botarga. See, a little lemon juice, olive oil, black pepper. Got right. a party. All right, must be real thin though. So thin. Oh my god. Yeah. You gotta okay. risk Rotter life and limb on delicious. that mandolin. All right, man. Let's ever try I, it. Don't tell that to my cutting board when I accidentally leave raw artichokes on it and then it poisons everything else. Don't do that. Do not do that, people. Well, Katie, thanks for coming on. Thank Cooking you for issues. having me. Grazie. 